Maranatha, my loved ones, and welcome to another presentation of our Prophecy Seminar, Unveiling Revelation, Your Life is About to Change Forever. I want to welcome you to a wonderful topic that we have today, titled The Mark of the Beast. Revelation unveils the mark of the beast, and so this is a, one of the more anticipated uh, questions uh, that people bring forth in regards to Bible prophecy, and so we're going to tackle this Today, and we're going to let Scripture prepare us so that we can see what exactly is God's plan for us. And so let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another beautiful day of life. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together and study your word, share it, so we can have a better understanding of uh, your will, of your guidance, and a better understanding of who you are as you uh, reveal these things to us, Father, so that we can be prepared, so that we are not deceived in these end times. And so we thank you, Father. We ask that you help us not only to understand what we're going to study, but that we may live by it. And so we thank you again for the presentation of your word, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So please join me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, we've been uh, breaking down this three angels message, right? God's everlasting gospel, the plan of salvation in these end times. And it says in Revelation chapter 14, Verse numbers nine. Then the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he shall drink of the wine of the wrath, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And so here we are being warned about not only worshiping the beast and the image of the beast, but if we end up doing these things, if we end up worshiping or obeying, the beast and the image of the beast, we will receive the mark of the beast, right? And so it also says here in Revelation chapter 13, verse number 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and, sl and, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehands and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so we are warned about this mark because this mark is closely associated with the image of the beast, which, with the false system of worship that is going to be imposed. And so when you accept the authority of the beast, when you accept, accept the, the, the power of the beast, when you put your mind and you give your life over to the beast, you will obey it and you will receive the mark, right? Now, we've already identified the beast in Revelation, and we saw that the beast of Revelation, based on an extensive study going through Daniel chapter 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and the book of Revelation, using the uh, prophetic principles of interpretation in the sense of, right, the cyclical, repetitive nature that, that pro Bible prophecy has, so that we are sure and we're guaranteed that we're understanding and following correctly. We found that the beast of Revelation is none other than the Vatican City, right? And the little horn, the Antichrist power, uh, king rises up from the beast, and that is the papacy. Now, before we start, in case there's somebody that's watching this, pro this program for the first time, I want to be very clear. We are not in any way, shape, or form uh, trying to humiliate, trying to denigrate, trying to talk down to uh, Catholicism, right? Catholicism are basically the people that believe in the Catholic faith, uh, and there are many, many, I would say the majority are sincere, believing, uh, God-loving people in, in the Catholic Church. We are not talking about Catholics, we are talking about the institution of Catholicism, the teachings, the practices, the doctrines that come forth from the headquarters, which is the Vatican, and the head, which is the papacy, because sadly, it is contrary to the word of God. And so remember, our battle and our war is not against people, but it is against deception, against lies. And the Bible teaches that this system, uh, despite the sincerity of the majority of its followers, is not a biblical, is not founded on Biblical principles, it's founded on, sadly, tradition and paganism. And so by identifying the beast, now we need to identify the mark, right? Because the mark is, comes from the beast, and it says that the beast is going to impose this mark. So that means that then, to understand the mark of the beast, we need to go to the beast. But before we do that, my loved ones, I want to share with you and break this concept down about exactly what is happening here. What it's telling us, my loved ones, is that in the end times, there's going to be a test, right? There's going to be a test of faith. And so everybody is going to be tested 
in one way, shape, or form. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. It says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon who? Upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. So there's going to be a final test that God is going to present to his people, a final test of loyalty that God is going to bring forth, and it is going to show and prove who is our loyalty with, who do we worship, who do we obey, who do we honor. And based on that test, everybody will make a decision either in favor or against uh, the everlasting gospel, in favor or against the wine of Babylon, in favor of against God, in favor of against the enemy. And so we want to make sure, my loved ones, that we are on the right side, right? And so in the same way that there was a one very simple test in the beginning with Adam and Eve, one simple tree, right? Just a tree. Very basic, nothing complicated about that test. And our first fathers and mother didn't, were not able to pass that test. So also it's telling us that in the end, God is going to have his final test of faith, as it was mentioned in Revelation. And everybody's going to have to go in through these. Now, before we talk about the mark of the beast, we're going to see that the mark of the beast is a falsification of the seal of God. Notice that the enemy, when he is presenting, when he is seeing what God presents, he, in his deceptive ways, he tries to falsify, to counterfeit anything that God is doing. And so when we talk about the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast is really the counterfeit to the seal of God. God presents the seal as his original, and the mark of the beast then is what would be the counterfeit to that concept. Now, if you, we go to Revelation chapter 7, I want you to join me, please. Revelation chapter 7, it talks about the seal of God. Revelation chapter 7, and we're going to read in verse number 1 through 3. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four corners, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So, this is saying that God is, has his four angels holding back the winds, right? Strife, battle, conflict. And he's holding back, he's limiting the power of the enemy. Until when? Until God's people are sealed, until they receive the seal of God. In other words, once God's people have been sealed... Those angels are going to let go, and basically that's the, going to be the end of probation. That is going to be the end of the patience of God. And so once everybody has been sealed with the seal of God, and by contrary, if you do not receive the seal of God, you receive the mark of the beast, then the seven plagues are going to fall, and we're going to have a presentation on the seven plagues coming up. Now, I want to prove this point to you so you can see this. God's seal is going to protect God's people. God says, wait, put the seal to protect my people first, and then we'll let go of the winds, and then the plagues are going to begin to fall, the seven plagues. And look at what it says in Revelation chapter 16, verse number 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went out and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the seal of God. No, that's not what it says there. It says they had, came on the, those that had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So notice, my loved ones, if everybody would receive that, that uh, loathsome sore, it would just say the sore fell on everybody as the other plagues would fall. But no, it says that the sore specifically falls on who? On those that have the mark of the beast, implying that those that have the seal of God will not be affected by these plagues. So this is going to be the protection that God is going to pray, present to his people. Now, Again, to understand this, my loved ones, God is, everybody is going to be sealed or marked in the end time. And that seal or mark is going to identify who do you belong to, who is your loyalty to, who do you give, over, who do you give your life over, who do you give your mind over, who, is, who do you dedicate your life to. And so this seal that God is going to place is going to protect God's people, contrary to the mark, which identifies those that follow and obey the beast, are going to receive the mark of the beast. Now, Again, when we're talking about the seal of God and the mark of the beast, then we should be going directly to the uh, teachings, the doctrines, right, in regards to God. Because those that follow the doctrines and the teachings will receive the seal. And contrary, those that follow the doctrines and teachings of the beast will receive the mark of the beast. Now, the word seal, mark, and, and uh, sign are interchangeable in Hebrew and in Greek. If you do a study on these words, 
the word mark, seal, and sign are interchangeable, right? And so, for example, there are some Bible versions that say it's the seal of the beast or the mark of God. It's the same thing, mark, seal, and sign. And so what does this do? You know, like when somebody buys cattle, right? What does a farmer or a rancher do when they buy cattle? They seal the animal, right? They brand it in that sense. And that is a sign or a seal who, who is the owner of that cattle. And that's what's happening in the end time. God is going to put also his seal upon those that belong to him and those that belong to him. Now, we find this concept of sealing and not sealing. We find it. Remember, Daniel, I'm sorry, John is using uh, examples from the past. He's using events and people and, and, and places that have happened in the past as he's using these as concepts to talk about the end times in the book of Revelation. So when it talks about this sealing, that implies that some type of sealing must have occurred before the book of Revelation. And he writes the book of Revelation where he feeds and he takes off of that example. I want you to go with me, please, to Ezekiel. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 9, and I'm going to show you where this shows up. This concept of sealing comes forth for God's people. Go with me to Ezekiel, please. Ezekiel chapter 9, and we want to, I want to share with you, I want you to read with me where this sealing concept comes from. And it says in Ezekiel chapter 9, and this is very important because this is going to help us find out what is the mark of the beast. Now, it's a very simple subject study what we're going to do. We're going to look at the seal of God because by identifying the seal of God first, then we're going to see that the mark of the beast is very simple, right? It's just a contrary to what the seal of God is. We're going to look at the seal of God. We're going to study that concept of worship and then we're going to study the concept of the abominations in that context because we're going to see that the abominations is actually the worst of the, uh, the mark of the beast, I'm sorry, is the work of, worst of the abominations that come from the beast, that come from this system. So, Ezekiel chapter 9, verse number 1. It says, Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faced north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a rider's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze, uh, the bronze altar. Now, where's the bronze altar? It's in the outer court. Now, the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man's, and he called the man clothed with linkhorn who had the rider's inkhorn at his side. And now God is going to speak to this man. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on their foreheads, on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. And to all the, and to others he said in the three, to in the in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have pity on any of them. And he's basically saying, slay all of them, right? That do not have that mark or that seal of God. So what's happening is that there are abominations that are occurring inside of the sanctuary. Those abominations are explained in, in Ezekiel chapter 8. We're going to see that uh, in, a, in a while because these abominations, or what has happened as we talked about previously, are being practiced inside of God's church, inside of the sanctuary. And so what God says is, listen, because they continue to practice these abominations in my house, because they continue to trample and defile on my sanctuary... I'm going to, I mean, you know, God's patience is being, is running short. And he's saying, that's it. I'm not going to deal with this anymore. So put a seal, a mark on those that are, are honoring me, that are seeing these things and it hurts and it's painful for them. But put, and anybody that has that seal, they are protected. But whoever does not have the seal or the mark of God in this context, he says, what? Slaughter them, right? And that's exactly what's happening in the end time. God says, put a seal on my people and those that do not have the seal, in other words, that have the mark, they are going to receive the wrath of God poured out with what? With the seven plagues of Revelation. Now, to be able to identify this seal, we need to then go to Scripture again. Amen? And so when we go to Scripture, we find that there is very clearly in the Bible, we are explained what is the seal of God. Now, look at what it says here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Believing in Him, Christ, you were what? You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So Ephesians very clearly says that who is or what is the seal of God? It is the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
So the Holy Spirit is known as the seal of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So what is the guarantee that we know that God is working in our hearts, that God is working in our lives? Is that we see the Holy Spirit working through us, right? And it says here that we are sealed with the Spirit and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit where? In our hearts. Now, why is this important? And remember, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says, Peter says, repent and be baptized, all of those, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive forgiveness of sins, I'm sorry, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when we come to Christ, when we surrender our life to Christ, what happens is that our sins are forgiven and our body at that moment becomes a temple because the Holy Spirit then enters into us to begin the process of sanctification, of cleansing, right? To cleanse us from the ways of the world, to cleanse us from the ways of the flesh and to purify and clean us to restore the character of Christ in us. Remember, we cannot live in the presence of God if we do not have our characters purified and cleansed from the ways of the flesh. And so, that's the gift of the Spirit. And how do we know that we have the Spirit? Because our lives are being transformed. They are being changed. We are seeing that there is a difference in who we are, and we are seeing the work of God in our lives. And so, that's the Holy Spirit. But we have a problem with this. To identify the Holy Spirit solely as a seal of God. And what is the problem is that the Holy Spirit has always been with us. It says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the earth right before creation. And so to call the Holy Spirit the seal of God ex exclusively is limited because the Spirit has always been with us. And in Revelation chapter 7, it's talking about what? It's talking about a special sealing. It's a sealing that's going to occur right before the end, right before the close of probation, right before the end of this earth. And so what it's telling us is it's implying, it's not explicitly saying, but it's implicit, is that the seal of God is the Holy Spirit and he's always been here, but there's going to be a special sealing through the Holy Spirit in the end times, right before the end. So this end time sealing has to do with the Holy Spirit because he's the one that is sealed in our hearts, but there's something more. That has to occur. Now, watch what it says here in the context of Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with what? With the finger of God. And so it says here that the finger of God did what? Wrote the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. But notice something very interesting as well. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. If I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now notice this parallel verse in Matthew 12, 28. If I cast out demon by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So here Jesus Christ is saying that the finger of God is who? Is the spirit of God. And the spirit of God does what? He seals, he writes in this context. Now, how can we understand this? How can we make this clear? Very simple. When we talk about the seal, there's a two ways to understanding the seal. There is the instrument that seals, and there is, then is the result of that instrument that seals. For example, when you go to the post office, right, you buy a stamp. And so before days, now we, we stick a stamp, but before it used to be stamped on that letter, it would be stamped on some type of uh, document, some official document. When you get a notarized, uh, uh, notarized uh, paper, they, they'll, the lawyer will stamp, right? Now, we'll notice something very interesting, that the stamp is known as the instrument that is being used, but it's also known as what is the result of that instrument. That is also called a stamp or a seal, right? What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that the Holy Spirit is the seal of God in the context of that He is the one that is the instrument that seals or writes. And then what is he sealing or writing? He's sealing or writing something, right? There's something that is being sealed in, in the context of the Ten Commandments, it was sealed on the tablets of stone that it was written through the Spirit of God. Now watch what it says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my people. So in the same way that the Ten Commandments was sealed onto those two tablets of stone. It's telling us that God also does what? He seals, right? He writes 
His law. Where does he write and seal his law? On our hearts. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put or I will seal or write my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So it says here, my loved ones, that the new covenant, what does God do? He writes or seals his law, where? On our minds or on our hearts, right? And who's the one that does that? It's the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit is the one that writes or seals the law in our hearts and on our minds. Now the question is, why does the Holy Spirit need to seal or write the law of God in our hearts and in our minds? What is the purpose behind that? Well, look at what it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With the point of a diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart. Here's the answer. Why is it that God has to write his law on our heart and on our minds? It's because, my loved ones, when we are born, we are born with a fallen nature. We are born with a selfish nature that we have, a, we have been contaminated, right? We have been contaminated with a virus of selfishness. And that virus or selfishness is written in our hearts, right? It's part of our human nature. That selfishness is there. And so God has to then do what? God has to write his law to what? To counteract that law that is written in our hearts, that law of sin. Watch this, my loved ones. It says it. In Romans chapter 8, Paul explains this very, very clearly in Romans chapter 8, and we're going to go and read verses number 22. Romans chapter 8, verse 22 and 23. It says like this. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Here we are. Paul says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. So the law of, of God, he says, I delight in my mind. But there's another law in my members and brings me into captivity to the law of what? To the law of sin, which is in my members. So we have this fallen nature, my loved ones, that it impedes us from being able to follow, to live according to the principles of heaven, this fallen nature that pushes us, that gives us a tendency, inclination, right, to the ways of the flesh, and so what does God have to do? He has to then, to counteract that, to balance it out, he then has to write his law in our hearts with what purpose and what reason? To give us willpower so that we can uphold the principles of God in our lives. And so the purpose of the reason God gives us his spirit and the spirit writes his law in our hearts is so that we can live according to those principles, so that we can follow those principles in our life. And so God gives us back, he gives us willpower, right? We did not have any willpower to avoid, to counteract our fallen nature. And so God, when he gives us his spirit, it's so that now we have the power to say, I see what sin is, I see what temptation is, and I don't want anything to do with it, right? And so if you read, for example, in, in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 and 27, it says very clearly there that God gives us a new heart, right? He gives us a new heart, why? Right? Because this heart that we have has sinful tendencies, right? It has sinful nature. And so God wants to give us a new, a human heart, a heart of flesh, it says there, making representation to this new mind, this new thought pattern, these new paradigms so that we can move away from this old thinking process from this that delighted in the ways of the world that delighted in the ways of the flesh and we can now want to live and delight in the ways of the spirit and so that's what it's talking about look at what it says in Romans chapter 8 verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in who in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death so what does the Spirit do? The Spirit writes the law of God in our hearts. And by giving us that, by having the power of the Holy Spirit, we now have the power to say no to sin, to say no to the ways of the flesh. We now have the power through the Holy Spirit to do what? To live according to the Word of God. And so we are free in that context from sin and from death. And I don't know about you, but I say praise the Lord for that. Now, going a little bit, a little bit deeper into this concept of the seal of God, the question then is, what is the seal of God, right, that we're talking about in the end time? So it's obviously related to the Holy Spirit, and it's obviously related to the Ten Commandments, because that's what the Holy Spirit is writing in our hearts and in our minds, those ten principles, right, those ten promises that we can live according to the will of God. 
And so it's very interesting because when you find in Scripture and in history the concept of a seal, you find that every seal has three characteristics. The seal, every seal has three characteristics. It has the name of the governor. It has the title of that person, right, in the context of we're talking about a king or that say. So it has the name. It has the title or authority. And it has the territory. Very Three very simple, basic things. I want to share a couple of seals with you so you don't think that I'm making this up. Uh, go with me to Daniel chapter 1. Watch this. Daniel chapter 1, there's a, uh, this, this concept of sealing with these three characteristics appears everywhere in Scripture. But here uh, there's two of them and it just makes it easier. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, I have a question. Did you see the two seals that were there? Probably not, right? Let's look at it again. Joachim, king of Judah. Remember, what are the two characteristics, the three characteristics? The name, Joachim. The title, king. The territory, Judah. Very simple. Look at another seal that is in that same verse. Nebuchadnezzar, name, king, title, Babylon, territory. Very simple, very basic. It says in Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus Christ was, um, what was arrested, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus Christ was not arrested, when he was, uh, when he was put in the tomb, it said that the Pharisees came to Pilate and said, listen, they're going to try to steal the body of Christ. You need to seal it. And so it says in Matthew 27 that Pilate said, okay, go seal that tomb. And what happened was is that his, the, the, uh, the soldiers went over and they put a seal on the tomb. Now, what do you think the seal said that was placed on the tomb of Jesus Christ? Name, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, title, governor, territory, Judea, right? What he was saying is that that seal showed that he had authority or power over that tomb. But of course, we know that that's not the case. Why? Because we saw that the angel came over. And what did the angel do? He basically just knocked that, that big stone over and then he sat on it, implying the true authority is of God, right? But that was the uh, earthly. Now, we, again, this is how this is represented in many different ways. For example, right now, in, in any governor on the, in any state, any president in any country, when they sign an official document, that's what they write down, right? They write the name, the title, and the kingdom that they are representing. Now, understanding that, that means that if the seal of God has these three characteristics and it's related to the Ten Commandments and it's related to the Holy Spirit who is writing the law of God in our heart and our mind, that means that then the seal of God, that this end time seal, this end time test must be found to have these three characteristics. And so do we find this among the Ten Commandments that it has these three? Oh, yes, we do, my loved ones. Go with me, please, to Exodus. Go with me to Exodus chapter 20, and I want to show you this seal or this sign that is very clearly explained in Scripture. Remember, the Holy Spirit is the seal of God. He is the instrument that seals. What does He seal? He seals the law of God where? In our hearts and in our minds. Why or with what purpose? So that we can obey God, so that we can follow His commandments, so that we can live according to these principles. Now, that seal, end time seal, has these three characteristics. The name, the title, and the territory. And do we find this in, in Exodus chapter 20? Among the Ten Commandments, yes, we do. Look at what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord your God. Let's jump to verse number 11. Why do we keep the Sabbath day? For in six days the Lord did what? The Lord made or created what? The heavens, the earth, the sea, the spring, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. I have a question. Do we find a seal among the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment? Yes. Name the Lord, Adonai, right? God. What? Ter uh, authority. He made. He is the creator. And what did he make or create? What territory? He made the earth, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. My loved ones, very clearly are we presented with the seal of God here. In this verse, it's telling us, God, the Lord, Adonai, did what? He is the creator and of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And so the Sabbath is the seal 
that identifies God as our creator. It is pointing to it. It is establishing this principle. And for that, I say, amen. Look at what it says in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13. Above all, above all you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a what? A sign, a seal, a mark between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does what? That sanctify you. Notice that we do not only keep the Sabbath because of creation. We do not only keep the Sabbath because of redemption, but we keep the Sabbath out of sanctification too. And I don't know about you, but I want to say thank you, God, and celebrate that. Look at what it says in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 19 and 20. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules and keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a what? A sign, a seal, a mark between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And I say again, amen to that, my loved ones. We keep the Sabbath not only because of creation, because of redemption, because of sanctification, and because God is our God. And if you believe that God is your God, then what is he saying? That sign or seal is evidence that you believe that because you keep my Sabbath day holy. And some people might ask, well, wait a minute. What about, how do, why, we, why are you saying that the Sabbath day is a celebration of redemption? It's very simple, my loved ones. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, when it records the Ten Commandments the second time, this is after the 40 years before they're going to go in the, the desert, it says that, they were keeping the Sabbath, Deuteronomy chapter 5, but this time it gives a different reason. Not because God is a creation, but because God has redeemed and saved us from slavery in Egypt or from slavery in sin. And so it says with a, with a strong hand and with outstretched arms. It's pointing to redemption. The Sabbath is a celebration of redemption also, and I'll give you a small pointer on that. When Jesus died, he died on Friday, right? Day of preparation. What day did he resurrect? He resurrected on Sunday. Why did he resurrect on Sunday? He could have resurrected on, on, on the Sabbath day. Nobody would have said anything against it, right? But what we see is that in the same way that Christ rested from his work of creation, he also rested from his work of redemption. And even, on, even at his death, even after saving, after redeeming, after dying for our sins, he did what? He rested from that work. So Sabbath is a celebration of creation, of redemption, of sanctification, but the Sabbath is also a, a celebration of glorification. How do we know that? Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, that from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me. So the Sabbath will be celebrated for the rest of eternity. Why? Because God has created us. He has redeemed us. He is sanctifying us. I don't know about you, but I want to thank God for the working and the power of the Holy Spirit to cleanse and restore his image in me. And because what else, my loved ones? Because he has glorified us for the rest of eternity. So the Sabbath, my loved ones, is a, an exterior sign to something that, has been ex, that is happening interior, right? It's an external reflection to what is happening internally, that you have accepted God, that you are celebrating God, and that's what the Sabbath is about. It's a weekly celebration pointing to God as our creator. Now, have we forgot about this celebration? Yes, we have. And that's why it says in Revelation 14, 7, worship him who did what? Who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That goes directly back to the Ten Commandments, and it goes directly back to creation. And that we're worshiping God, we're celebrating him as our creator. Did Jesus Christ cease to be our creator when he died on the cross and when he resurrected? No, of course not. He still is to this day, and that's why I say amen. And so that's going to be the final test, my loved ones. Are we honoring, are we upholding all of the Ten Commandments, especially that fourth commandment, which is the seal, the sign of God? Now, if that is the case, that the seal of God in this context is the Sabbath day, that last test, then that means that the mark of the beast must be something contrary to the seal of God or something contrary to the recognition of the Sabbath day pointing to God as our creator. And so when we look then into the Vatican, into the beast system, right? It's not an insult. It's just a term talking about this country, this antichrist system, the one that says that he is Christ on earth. That means, my loved ones, that if the seal of God is going to be received by those in the end times that want to honor and uphold the principles of heaven, the principles of the Ten Commandments and the principles of God as our creator and celebrate that by keeping the Sabbath day, then that means that the mark of the beast must be something contrary to God's Sabbath day. Now, 
We talked about the abominations, right? And we talked about how the, in Ezekiel chapter 9, they were practicing these abominations. And God says, I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Now, I want you to go with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 8, because I want to show you one of these abominations. Now, there are a number of abominations that we have there. I want to show you one of them. Ezekiel chapter 8, and this directly points to this concept of the mark of the beast, Ezekiel chapter 8. Now, what do we have in Ezekiel chapter 8? In Ezekiel chapter 8, we have four abominations. Remember, these are pagan practices and philosophies and ideas that are being in introduced into the church and presented as if they come from God. But Ezekiel chapter 8 talks to us about these four abominations, and each one is worse and worse and worse. But that means when you come to the last one, the last one should be the worst of all of the abominations. So go with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 8, and look at what it says here in verse number 15. This is the last abomination. Let's do the verse 13 to look at the context. Then he said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of God? Turn again and you will see greater abominations than these. And this is the last abomination. And this is why God sealed his people and destroyed all those that didn't because they were practicing these abominations. And what does it say? Verse 16. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were 25 men. These are elders. These are leaders with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their face towards the east. And what were they doing? They were worshiping the sun toward the east. So what abomination, what was the worst abomination based on Ezekiel chapter 8 happening in the church, happening among God's people? The, the elders, the leaders had their back to the Ark of the Covenant, basically is what it's saying. And they were looking or bowing down towards the east. And what were they worshiping? They were worshiping the sun. Now I have a question for you. On what day do you think they were worshiping the sun? It's very clear. The sun was worshiped on the first day of the week. That's why it's called sun day. And so we are here presented with the worship of the sun on the first day of the week. It's among God's people and it was an abomination. Why? Because God told them very clearly, do not worship the sun, the star, the seas. No, he says, worship me as the creator. Don't worship them. But what happens is God people, they went away. Now we already warned about this. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, when it says that the little horn was going to trample on the law of God, right? Specifically on what law? On, on, we saw the example already, but we're talking about that fourth commandment, right? That fourth commandment was trampled on. Whoo! Now, if the fourth commandment is being trampled on and the Sabbath day is being forgotten, what is being substituted or put in its place? Of course, my loved ones, it would be Sunday worship as the day of the Lord, right? And so the seal of God being what? The Sabbath day, the day that points to God as a creation. But here they stop worshiping God as the creator. They stop pointing and making their focus God in their worship. And they started worshiping creation, right? And they started worshiping the sun. And so immediately we know when was this happening and how. And so what are we saying? Yes, exactly. We're saying, my loved ones, that what the mark of the beast represents is those that choose to follow and obey the commandments of the beast, of the papacy in the Vatican, which has to do not with Sabbath worship, but with Sunday worship. And you're like, what? Sunday worship? Yes. Watch here. Arthur P. Stanley, History of the Eastern Church. Look at what he says. The retention of the old pagan name of Dia Solis for Sunday is in great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment, which with the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day of the sun. So here it is. We talked about this previously. That what? Sunday was the day that the, 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 was the first day of the week was the day that the sun was worshipped. And as I mentioned, during the time of Constantine, they transferred, right? They tried to Christianize the pagans. And what did they end up doing? They ended up paganizing Christianity. And this 
practice of Sunday keeping, which was worship towards the sun, was now brought into Christianity to try to justify trying to Christianize these pagans. And so this historian clearly tells and points to that very same principle. And you're probably saying, oh, that's just a historian. That doesn't come from the church. Okay. Here's Wildem Gildea. He's a, a, a Catholic scholar, and he wrote in the Catholic world, March 1894. The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. The sun has worshipers at this hour in Persia and other lands. There is in truth something royal, kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of justice. Hence the church, the Catholic church, says here, in these countries would seem to have said, let's keep the old pagan name Sunday. So this is a Catholic scholar, historian, explaining the very same principles. And look at what it says. It shall remain consecrated and sanctified, and thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Balder became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. And so here's a Catholic source explaining the same principle. What? That the Catholic Church took Sunday, which was a pagan festival, a pagan feast day, and they did what? They said now, oh, the Sabbath day is no longer the day of the Lord. We're going to transfer it over to Sunday. And that is our authority. That is our power. Now, you're probably saying, oh, I think that that scholar, he was kind of, he was kind of off the charts. He didn't really know what he was talking about. Okay, let's go straight to the horse's mouth. John Paul II wrote a book, Dias Domini, in 1998. Look at what it says on page number 27. The distinction of Sunday from the Jewish Sabbath. Don't know where he got that because the Sabbath was created at the beginning with Adam and Eve and they weren't Jew, Jewish. The distinction of Sunday from the, Sabbath, from the Jewish Sabbath grew ever stronger in the mind of the church. Here's this important phrase, pastoral intuition. In other words, the papacy. Pastoral intuition suggested to the church the Christianization of the notion of Sunday as the day of the sun, which was the Roman name for the day in which is retained in some modern languages. And it continues. This was in order to draw the faithful away from the seduction of cults which worship the sun and to direct the celebration of the day to Christ, humanity's true son. My loved ones, this is straight from the mouth of the Pope himself. He is saying, we're the one that did it. We're the one that changed it. Why? Because we tried to Christianize these pagans, right? We said, oh, they're already keeping Sunday. Let's just transfer it over. And it, and it, it makes, and if you don't know this, the, the, the foundation of the Sabbath, you'll be like, yeah, that sounds right. But when you look at what the Bible says, this is what? This is a, an abomination because God did not say that is the first day of the week. He said, it's my Sabbath day. And so by them introducing this, by them trying to change the sanctity of the Sabbath day, what are they doing? They are, abom they are presenting an abomination to God's word. And look at what it says here. C.F. Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons, in an answer to a letter regarding the change of the Sabbath, November 11, 1895, he says it very clear. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change of Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And look at this phrase. And the act is what? A mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. The Catholic Church themselves say what? The mark or the sign or the seal of our power and our authority in religious matters has to do with what? It has to do with we impose Sunday and everybody is keeping Sunday. So that is our mark. That's why the Bible calls it the mark of the beast. And now you're probably saying, well, wait a minute. How, who gave her this authority? Remember, she believes that she has authority over Scripture. We talked about that already in the past when we talked about the uh, doctrine defined by the Council of Trent. They said tradition, not scriptures, is the foundation. And that's why it says in Daniel 7.25 that we're going to try to change the times and the law because the papacy believes that he is God on earth, right? He is Christ on earth. He has the power and authority and prerogatives of God. Now, I'm going to show you something that you should blow your mind away because you're probably saying, oh, this doesn't sound right. This is kind of weird. Okay, perfect. I'm going to show you that the papacy themselves, they know that the Sabbath is the seal of God. And they recognize that Sunday is the mark of the beast. Watch this. Pa John Paul II, again, the same apostolic letter, Dies Domini, page 81 to 83. Look at what he wrote. This is John Paul II speaking. Seal of the creative work was the blessing and consecration of the day in which God ceased 
all the created work that God had done. When the commandment of God says, remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it, the rest sent to honor that day dedicated to him is not for man a heavy imposition, but rather a reminder of his dependence on the creator. Amen. I couldn't have said it any better. I couldn't have not presented this any better. They themselves are saying that the Sabbath is the seal of God pointing to his creative work. Amen. And so it's clearly showing that they're saying this. This points to God as the creator, and that is the seal of God. Amazing. The papacy themselves say that the Sabbath is the seal of God. Now watch how they point to, again, that Sunday is the mark of the beast. John Paul, same letter. This is on page 43. An oriental author of the beginning of the third century says that even then in each region, the faithful regularly sanctified Sunday, not the Christian faithful, the pagan faithfuls, and look at what it says here. Spontaneous practice later became a legally established norm. The day of the Lord, Sunday, has what? Marked the millennial history of the Catholic Church. What is he saying? Sunday is what? Has marked the history of the Catholic Church. Sunday, is their saying, is the mark of the beast. And that's why the Bible calls that, my loved ones. Seal of God, pointing to God as the creator, pointing to God and honoring God's day, or what? Or the mark of the beast, pointing to a recognition of the authority of the church, the authority of the beast in that context. And so this should open our eyes, my loved ones, because it's so clearly they're saying it themselves, which is the seal and which is the mark. Look at this other quote from the Catholic record, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and the transference of Sabbath observance to Sunday is proof of that. Deny the authority of the church, and you have no adequate or reasonable explanation or justification for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday in the third commandment of God. We know it's the fourth commandment, right? We talked about that. So they're saying what? That is their authority. It's their mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is what? Is proof of that fact again my loved ones they're confirming what we're talking about let's look at another quote from the catholic universal bulletin 1942 look at what it said what it says the roman catholic church changed the observance of the sabbath to sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by the founder jesus christ i don't know who gave her that authority that's what she says but the bible doesn't say that the protestant claiming that the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventists are the only consistent Protestants. Whew, I want you to keep that quote up for a second there. I want to point to something very interesting. It says there that the, Sabbath, that, that the, the church believes that she has authority and power, and so anybody that has or decides that the only guide of faith is Scripture should be keeping Sabbath and not Sunday. And it says that the Seventh-day Adventists are the only consistent Protestants. When you ask me why I am a Seventh-day Adventist, it says it right here. It's because my only guide of faith is the Bible. And since Sunday is not the day that the Lord established, that's why I don't follow it. I follow Sabbath day, amen. It's not about what day it is. It's about what day does God say it is. And that's how clear and direct this quote is. Let's look at another quote here. It says in St. Sant and the uh, Sentinel St. Catherine Catholic Church, it says people who think that Scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. That's exactly what I'm pointing to, my loved ones, and that's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, because of this. Now, some people say, Are you, this is absurd what you're talking about. Are you telling me when you're talking about the mark of the beast that the Catholic Church is going to use the powers of the state to impose Sunday worship. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's what the Bible is pointing to. It's that they're going to impose the mark of the beast on the whole world, right? They're going to impose Sunday laws through the power of civil authority. And some people say, that is completely absurd. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to show you some evidence that this is already written in Catholic canon law. This is already part of the law code of the Vatican. Look at what it says here. Council of Laodicea, 4th century, canon law number 29. What does it say? It says, Christian must not Judaize, 
by resting on the Sabbath, right? Because they believe that those that keep the Sabbath are Jews. But must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day, which they believe is Sunday, and if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any should be found to be Judaizers, or in other words, keeping the Sabbath, let them be an anathema or a curse for Christ. My loved ones, it's already written in Catholic law. What is written? That Sabbath, that Sunday is the day that you should keep, and that anybody that keeps Sabbath is what? Is a curse to Christ. There, it's already written, and that's exactly what happened during the Inquisition, my loved ones. What happened? They said it very clearly. They would, a lot of people died at the stake. They were burned alive, tortured. Why? Because they were keeping the Sabbath day. And they said, oh, you must be a Jew. They're like, no, we're not Jews. We're keeping the Sabbath day Sabbath. We're following the Bible. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You're going against the authority of the church. You're a Jew. And they would murder them. They would torture them to try to get them to recant. Now, this should be nothing new, my loved ones. What I'm saying is not only are they going to impose Sunday laws, but they're going to make it illegal to keep the Sabbath day. This is the final battle of worship in the end times. And you're like, oh, please, this is so ludicrous. Okay, let's look at another point. Pope John Paul II called to worship welcome. This is Detroit News 1998. What did John Paul II say? John Paul II sent a very stern warning to Catholics to respect and keep Sunday for worship. Now, listen to this. He even said that if someone violates this mandate, they should be punished as a heretic. Question, when did the church used to punish people as heretics? During the Inquisition, when they had what? When they had the civil political powers in their hands during the 1,260 days. And so what is he saying? He's saying you should, right? If anybody that violates that, they should be punished as a heretic. Violate what? Not keeping Sunday holy, my loved ones. And this is the very point. And they're going to impose this by civil laws. That's what the Bible says. They're going to impose using the power of the state. State and church, church and state are going to come together again. And they're going to what? They're going to impose these Sunday laws. And you're saying, what? It's already in the canon law. Look at this. Catholic Catechism from the Libreria Edrix Vaticana. That's Latin, right? 2005 Page 98, look at what it says in the Catholic Catechism. Why is it important to civilly recognize Sunday as a holy day, right? That means to make it, enforce it, civil law. Look at what they say. It is important that Sunday be civilly recognized as a holy day so that everyone has the real possibility of enjoying enough rest and free time that allow them to make, take care of religious, family, cultural, and social life. Leave that quote up for a second, please. What are they saying? They're saying that we should impose Sunday at, by law. Why? To enjoy family, free time, religious, cultural, social life, to have rest from work. You notice that this is not a bad intent, right? It sounds nice. It sounds cool. If you don't know the foundations of Scripture, it, it sounds logical. But what they're saying is, my loved ones, they're going to trample on the Lord's Day to celebrate this day as their holy day. And look at the excuse. Now they're using the environment, right? Oh, the environment needs to rest. And so what we find, my loved ones, is they're also using the excuse of a day of rest for the environment or climate change. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with helping the environment. On the contrary, we want to do good. But when this goes against God's principles, against God's commandments, against what God has established, then I have a problem, my loved ones. And this is exactly what is being presented in this context. The church is going to use this. And the mark of the beast is when what? When the Catholic church uniting with Protestants. They're not Protestants anymore. I'm sorry. They're Christians because they're not protesting. They're, they're coming together as we've studied already. When they come together in the United States and they form this political power, it's going to be 70 to 75 percent of the population. They are going to then what? They're going to then stress, impose upon the, uh, the uh, congressman on the legislative body to impose Sunday laws. They're not going to say no because they just want to get reelected. They want to stay in power. And they're going to say, oh, it sounds good. It sounds great. The president's not going to say anything. He's not going to veto a law like that because he, they, we already saw the papacy and the president are hand in hand. They're the two most powerful people in the world. And then you go to the Supreme Court. They're going to be like, oh, no, the majority of them are Catholic. Oh, no, that sounds very good. We need to establish some limits because life is just getting out of control morally, everything. And so everybody's going to fall in line. That's what the prophecy is saying. And that's when our beloved country is going to make an image 
to the beast, my loved ones. And so what is that? When, my loved ones, these laws are imposed. Remember, the mark of the beast has not come yet because this law has not been imposed. Even though there are Sunday laws, and I think most of the states in this country and around the world, you see them in one way, shape, or another. This is going to be imposed on a national level on across the board. And that, my loved one, is when the mark of the beast will be risen up and everybody will have to make a decision in favor or against, right? And they're going to do what? They're first, they're going to do it on the good hands, right? They're going to try to persuade you to keep it, but then they're going to start using some coercion, right? They're going to some force. They're going to say, listen, if you don't accept this authority, you're not going to be able to buy and sell. They're going to probably hold off as they can do now with the, with the push of a button and hold off everything because every, all the transactions we do, the majority of them, are electronically. And so they'll be able to cut off our bank accounts to try to force you to say, listen, you need to feed your family. You need to keep your business running. And that's what they're going to do. My loved ones, it's amazing what Scripture says, and this is nothing new. This has already been done in the past many times. Even here in the United States in 1888, they tried to pass a Sunday law, and it didn't happen, but it is going to come, my loved ones. And so some people say, what does it mean that it's going to be on the forehead or on the hand? Very simple. The mark on the forehead represents our, our conscious decisions, right, our frontal lobe. And so there are people that are going to recognize and accept this authority because of religious conviction, because that's what they were taught, that's what they believed, that's what they followed. But there's, on the other hand, you have those that receive the mark on their hand. And in the Bible, the hand re represents what? Our works, our labors. So there are going to be people that maybe do not have a religious affiliation to, the, to, 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 uh, to Catholicism or to Christianity in general, but because of what? Because of convenience, economic convenience. I need to keep my store running. I need to feed my family. So I'm just going to say yes, and I'm going to follow along with this system, and they will receive the mark on their hand. Is everybody with me, my loved ones? This is what's coming, my loved ones. I know it's amazing, and it's fascinating the things. I mean, we've been showing evidence, my loved ones, but this is what's going to happen in the end. But Scripture says that there's going to be a faithful people of God in the end times that have the seal. And what are they going, what is going to, what is heaven going to be saying about them? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Look at what it says. Here, they're going to be pointing to this group of people. Here is the perseverance of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and keep the faith of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a people in the end time, a remnant church, a small group of people that is going to say, no matter what it costs, whether it's going to be the insults, the imprisonment, uh, torture, murder, as it happened in the past during the Protestant Reformation and throughout the history of Christianity and throughout the history of God's people, really, God always has a faithful people that say what? As Daniel chapter 3, those three boys said, we prefer to die than trample on God's commandments. We prefer to die than trample on the heavenly principles of holiness that God has established through those Ten Commandments. I don't know about you, my loved ones, but I want to be one of those faithful. And by being faithful in the end times, by being faithful at that moment, I want to be faithful today. And so I invite you to say, today, God, I accept your Ten Commandments and your fourth one. I want to keep the Sabbath day holy. God bless. God bless.